Ah, yes, the splendor of the great outdoors. Undeniably, one of the best parts of my job is constantly being exposed to the natural beauty of the world around us. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Obviously, mankind has made quite an impact on the planet, but there is such a resurgence these days of going all natural. Maybe not that kind of all natural, but more of a connection to the natural world. Today, we're going to get our hands in the soil, discover eco-friendly alternatives for household items, and taste what being all natural is all about. So let's get started. For over 2,000 years, humans have been cultivating the leafy cousin of broccoli, kale. Up until the Middle Ages, it was one of the most common greens in all of Europe. It's seen a resurgence in recent years due to its hardiness in cold weather and high nutritional value. Today, my friend Allison Chino shows us her super easy, no-cook sesame kale salad. So what's the deal with kale? I mean, it's like suddenly everybody's talking about kale. Everybody, like it's a trendy, trendy food right now. It really is, mm -hmm. and it's a superfood. Mm -hmm. That's probably the reason they're talking about it, because it's so nutritious. Yes, and I love it because it holds up. It holds up really well. Well, it does. I mean, mm -hmm. if you buy it, it'll mm -hmm. last a long mm -hmm. time in your refrigerator mm -hmm. until you use it. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the easiest things to grow. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of the hottest cool season vegetables. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I'm, I've already started tearing this apart yes. because I can't wait to make this salad. Yes. So what we're starting out with, it looks like as a nice, good sized bundle of kale. This would be sort of about the size one would find in the grocery mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which looks to be about eight or nine stems of kale. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we're doing is we're just stripping the, the kale leaves off of the stalk. Mm -hmm. So is it the kale that gets your family excited and the kids excited about this recipe or is it the dressing? I think it's the dressing. Oh, and is it? Especially okay. it's this um, sesame oil and soy sauce in it, so mm -hmm. it makes it kind of a salty I love that dressing. I'm gonna yeah. get started on that. And you, you put this dressing on the kale and leave it for a while and it almost marinates the kale oh, so it's not wonderful. as hard to chew. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, really flavorful. So I'm putting three fourths of a cup of oil mm -hmm. and then one fourth cup uh, soy sauce. Right. And a fourth of a cup of lemon juice. So that's your citrus. Very good. And then we're gonna do one um, tablespoon of sesame oil. Two tablespoons cider vinegar. Okay. Simple so enough. Simple, simple. Just mix that all together. And I like to uh, mix this salad up in the afternoon if we're gonna have it for dinner, so it really, you know, gets the flavor in the leaves really rich. Now there are six of you all, including yes. your husband. Yes. So four hungry children. Yes. Uh, is this recipe adequate for your family? Yeah, it is. If we're having, you know, if it's a side, if yeah, it's a right, side dish right. and we're having sure. you know, some chicken or something else with it. So you're mm -hmm. just bringing everything into solution with the oil. I'm bringing it all together. All right. mm -hmm. Now I'm almost finished with this curly kale. Yes. And then well, I put these button mushrooms in it and they soak up, put them in raw and um, they soak up this dressing as well. They really. So how many button mushrooms, Allison? is about eight ounces, I think, of button mushrooms. Yeah, so about mm -hmm. three cups. Mm -hmm. and so you're ready for the dressing. I think right? we're ready for the dressing. Right, these, I kind of finish here. these. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. There you go. Okay. You do the honors. And then you just want to get it tossed really well. You want everything coated. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want it coated really well. And the dressing sort of helps reduce the, the volume here. It does. So sometimes I'll make a double recipe of this because it... And if you make it like one day, will you serve it, you know, that evening or will you even wait until the next day? I would to serve even it? serve it the next day. You would? Okay. I would. Mm -hmm. right. It's holds a little up. it holds up. It's a little um you know, it loses some of the crunch to it. Right. But some people like it a little a little soggier. Yep, yep. How am I doing? I'm doing good. That looks really good. Good, good. And then another thing that I add to this salad that gives it a great um great flavor is these pickled onions. Mm -hmm. And I am using about a half a cup half of a pickled cup. onions. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very good, mm -hmm. look at that, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
And we're almost yeah. finished. We're almost finished. You put these sesame seeds on top. The finale, and how much you have there? About a fourth of a About cup? About a fourth of a cup. And toast I it. toast these. Yeah. Yes, and you just toast them for just a minute in mm. the oven because, you know, they burn quickly. Yes, so about no, I've five burned minutes is all you plenty need. Plenty of going. cookie sheets, though, yes, for sure. Look yes. at that. It's beautiful Isn't like that. that pretty? That is marvelous. Yes. Thank you for sharing yes. this recipe. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. When some people hear that they're going to taste a recipe that is all natural, they go, oh my gosh, this could taste like cardboard. Well, not all all natural recipes or foods are that way, most certainly. And this recipe that I'm sharing with you today is all natural, but it is so packed with flavor, you won't believe it. It's an alternative to the classic cheese ball. And you see, this is a recipe that uses no cooked ingredients, very few ingredients, and the flavor level, well, it's through the roof. It's perfect recipe for friends or family who might be lactose intolerant or may have some sort of allergy with regard to gluten and so forth. Anyway, let's get started. What you wanna do is you wanna use macadamia nuts that have been soaked overnight. And what I have here is one cup of macadamia nuts. I'm gonna add them to the food processor. You bring this one in over here. And then to create sort of a creamy effect, I'm using some raw almond butter. I'm just gonna put this raw almond butter in here and I'm only using a tablespoon of this, but um, once you make one of these, you may want your non-cheese ball cheese ball to be a little smoother and creamier. If so, what you do is you just add a little bit more of this almond butter. Now, what I'm gonna do is just take and put the top on the food processor here and blend this together. Okay, now after about two to three minutes of this, what you wanna do is you wanna get this to the point where it's the consistency of ricotta cheese. It's just amazing what you can do with these nuts. It's um, fantastic. Now back to the macadamia nuts, you wanna make sure that they are raw, uh, not roasted, and they shouldn't have any salt on them at all. All right, so there we go. So that's the base of this delicious and healthy snack. Okay, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna add a few things that really boost the flavor. These are softened sun-dried tomatoes, and I've minced them, uh, just chopping them up with a knife, and I'm adding a half a cup of these. Now you wanna make sure they're not the sort of just air-dried tomatoes. These were packed in olive oil. We wanna mix this together along with about a half of a lemon. You wanna use a small lemon. You don't want too much here because you don't wanna overpower it. 
So that's about right there. And then some dried herbs, or you can use some that are fresh from the garden. Today we're using dried herbs. Now what I'm gonna do is take a half a teaspoon each of oregano, thyme, and a little basil. All right, and then what you wanna do is you wanna blend all of this together thoroughly and then just add salt and pepper to taste. Um, then what you can do is you can then form this into a sort of classic cheese ball. You can see how it all comes together and holds together quite nicely. The idea then is just to put it on a platter. You can garnish it and uh, serve it with some crackers if you wanna go all natural, use uh, just a raw vegetable like uh, celery. That's my favorite. Look how that comes together, it's beautiful. The flavor is excellent, so give it a try. Exploring Colonial Williamsburg is like taking a step back in time. While I was there, I met up with my friend, Laura Viancourt, to learn how gardening ideas from the 1700s are still being used today. Laura, it's so beautiful here in Williamsburg this time of year. It's, it's one of my perfect. favorite times to visit. Mine too. I'm glad you're here now. This is our interpretive site of gardening where people can see how gardening was done in the 18th century and they look over the fence and it connects them to plants. Not only can you see some of the heritage varieties that would have been grown in the 18th century here in Virginia, but you can also see some methods by which they were grown, like you have these wonderful little hot houses. That's right. My goodness, what beautiful lettuce. I know, look how pretty they are. We have the brown dutch, mm. tennis ball, Aleppo and Koss. I mean, this is a flower arrangement right here. And the advantage here is that you could get this lettuce growing weeks, if not a month ahead of right. normally planting it outdoors. That's right. In the 18th century, gardening reflected status and they had professional gardeners that could use hot beds and cold frames. Keep them warm at night, but most importantly, take them off during the day so you don't have cooked lettuce. Once they get started in the cold frame and hotbeds, we then move them out into the garden. But we need to protect them on these cool evenings. Yeah. So in the 18th century, they would have covered them with these bell jars. Those are so beautiful. Little mini greenhouses. <laughs> Just, but think about the labor. Every oh, night, wow. coming over, covering them up, and then taking them off yeah, you'd, again you'd in the to day. Yeah, you have an army of gardeners. That's right. So and They're so beautiful in the garden. They look like art. Mm -hmm, they do. And they're great to bring inside, too. You know, very popular for garden art inside. Mm -hmm, terrariums and things like that. Exactly. Yeah, is that broccoli over there? It is. It's purple broccoli. And look at these hoops or these twig structures you have over the broccoli. I know. Here we are using branches to make a support that you could lay cloth or paper over to protect the tender plants. And this is, this is a practice that you would have seen in the 18th century. Right. Yeah. And sometimes it was actually to keep plants dry. For example, we know melons like it dry. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we will actually use it to keep the plants dry so that they don't get too much rain on them. It's hard mm. to find purple broccoli in a store today, but here you can just pick it. Please yeah, sample I'll try some. That. Mm. Mm, it's so tender and it's so delicious. I love it. Mm. It's very pretty. It has a vibrant to yes. flavor to it. Now, yeah. when you cook it, it loses its purpleness, so that's why I like to use it in salads. Mm. Very good. Well, it's a pleasure to be back in Williamsburg. We are so glad that you are back. Thanks, mm. Alan. Thank you so much. Come back again. I can't wait. Now, if you really want to get fundamental, we have to talk about compost. Let me tell you, it is so easy to create your own compost bin, and there's no better way to go organic than to, well, recycle and reuse some of the things you otherwise might throw away.
You know, I'm always looking for interesting ways to display ordinary things like candles on a table for a party. So it's the fall of the year. What's plentiful out there? Certainly apples. You can find them at a farmer's market, a farm stand, you can go to the orchard, or you can just pick them up in the grocery store. What I'm doing here is I'm actually making some little apple candle holders for a festive table decoration. These are really easy to make. And let me just show you. It's as simple as taking an apple that, well, you wanna make sure that apple will sit by itself and sit upright so it doesn't roll around on the table for obvious reasons. This one is doing a sterling job. And I have one here that I've just placed a votive candle on the top and I used a pen just to go around and score the exact diameter of it. And you can see that circle there. Now it's just a matter of taking a little paring knife and cutting directly into the apple straight in like this and cutting very carefully around the edge. And then you can take a melon baller, which has a sharp edge, and you can just take out that core of the apple. See how simple this is? You get a nice clean cut edge with this melon baller. Okay, then it's just a matter of sort of sizing the candle. It's better not to make it too large in the beginning because you can always cut it out, but you can't put it back in there. All right, so there we go. And you can see that fits just about right with just a little pressure. What I like to do to keep the edges of the apple from shriveling because we've cut into it, it's likely to dehydrate and it will discolor as we know apples will. You can take just a little bit of lemon juice, this, and apply it to the flesh of the apple like that. That'll keep it from discoloring, at least for your party. Now the other thing that I've done with pumpkins and acorn squash and things like that that I've cut, you can actually take a little petroleum jelly or Vaseline and rub right around the edge and that will seal this off and keep it from uh, losing moisture and shriveling around the edge. Just another little tip. You see this sits in just like that and then you can light it and you can let some of the candle wax drip around the edges like I have here to sort of seal that gap if there is one between the candle and the apple itself. Now, you can see I have an arrangement here that the colors work beautifully with this. And just imagine these lining a table, all lighted with these beautiful arrangements. It can make a magical table setting. It's amazing the things that you can make in your own kitchen. I want to show you how to make a homemade moisturizer. This is a soy oil moisture bar, and it really, really works. And all you have to do is start with a double boiler. You don't have to buy a double boiler. What I like to do is just take a large saucepan like this, bring the water to a boil, and then just take a metal bowl and place it there. And then what you're going to do, you basically just have four ingredients in this. You're going to start with two parts soy wax, one part coconut oil to one part cocoa butter, and then you can use any sort of fragrance you like. Lavender's great. I'm gonna mix a little lavender with some rosemary. And this is the sort of thing that is so good for chapped hands if you've been working in the garden. It's all natural and very easy to make. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the soy wax. This is hydrogenated soy oil, which makes it uh, wax-like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let this melt, and you can see it's already melting. Beautiful. Look at that. So this is what 16 ounces of the wax looks like melted. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 8 ounces of this cocoa butter, and it will melt very quickly. And while that's melting, I'm going to go ahead and add the coconut oil. And you can see oh, coconut oil is an oil, but it, it's almost in a solid state itself at room temperature. It doesn't really take long for all three of these ingredients to come together. You see, the thing you want to do is just constantly stir it like this. Okay, now with everything melted, it's time to add the essential oils. And I like lavender, so I'm going to add about six drops of lavender. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven drops of lavender and then also some rosemary. Those two combined are wonderful. One, two, three, four, five, six. Mmm, what a great combination of aromas. Okay, 
Now it's time to pour the liquid into the molds. All right, you just wanna bring it over like this and then just begin to dip it out and you can fill these individual molds. What I like to do is just take a cooling rack and place them on the cooling rack with a little wax paper underneath. And if you can't find some of these molds or don't have them, you can use a little mini muffin pan like this and make great little lotion bars. Now I'll get all these poured up. I'll let them rest overnight. By then they'll be hard. They can be used or you can give them as gifts. Albert Einstein once said, look deep into nature and you'll understand everything better. Hope you'll find time to spend more time outdoors, enjoying it and also bringing the outdoors in. Appreciate the bounty and share it. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. Ah, oh, the great outdoors. I just love it. You know, okay. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Obviously, man made, man has made, okay? Someone in your family or a friend who might be glucose intolerant. Lactose intolerant. I'm, I'm having a, well, I'm, I'm having a glucose shortage right here. It's because I'm so sweet.